Hello, and welcome to the Turn by Turn podcast. I am joined, as always, with Chris, and I am talking a lot in the front because this is very much a Chris episode. And we, you are Daniel. Uh, yeah, I am Daniel. I always, I always remember something and then forget some other things. But I am Daniel. That's Chris. And we today we are talking Spirit of Sonata which is a game that is connected to the Warriors series that is produced by Koei Tecmo. And I've exhausted my knowledge on the topic. So, Chris, tell (laughs) us all about Spirit of Sonata. Yeah. So I figured because uh, first, let me justify this a little bit, because I know people are going to be like, this is an RPG show. You're talking about a Warriors game. Um, First of all, it's a it's a show for us to talk about our passions. So, yes. <laughs> yes, I am going to do that because I love the Warriors games. Um, but second of all, we've talked about what an RPG is, and I've got a very loose definition of that. And the Warriors games, above a lot of other games, really help me fall into a role and role play kind of. Um, I get really, really immersed in these games, and that is exactly what I'm looking for in a role-playing game. So if you want to know more about that, we have a great episode, I'm really proud of it, called Elements of an RPG. And for all of your turn-based needs, we will be back with some really, really turn-based stuff next time. Yes, we will. So uh, I decided since Daniel and a lot of our listeners might not know anything about the Warrior series, I figured I'd give a brief introduction to that series and sort of explain how that works, because I I found that really fascinating, too. The whole thing started with Dynasty Warriors, which is a game series many people have heard of, but don't know uh, that the original is actually a fighting game like Soul Calibur, just with historical figures. Um, Do you know that, Daniel? I did not. It was called Sangoku Muso, which translates to The Three Kingdoms Unrivaled. Uh, And if you don't know, The Romance of the Three Kingdoms is a Chinese epic that is a behemoth of a novel and is a fascinating story. But anyway, the game was made because the developer Hisashi Koinuma wanted to make a fighting game and realized existing studios that made fighting games would have already had their own ideas that conflicted with his own. So he was like, I want to go join a studio that's never made a fighting game. And so he ended up joining Koei, uh, who was known for their strategy games at the time, uh, Romance of the Three Kingdoms and Nobunaga's Ambition. Um, And he got assigned to W Omega Force, which was a new dev team that had never made a game before. So in North America and Europe, that fighting game is called Dynasty Warriors 1. Um, Then, as the PS2 era started, Koei wanted their fighting game to stand out from all the other ones when compared against uh, Street Fighter, Tekken, Soul Calibur, all these. Um, So they started having the idea of an entire battlefield instead of just one-on-one fights. So they made a spinoff in heavy quotes, which was called Shin Sengoku Muso, or True Three Kingdoms Unrivaled. Um, But not many people in the West, like the U.S. or Europe or any of that, know about Romance of the Three Kingdoms. So to preserve whatever brand recognition they built off that first game, we just called it Dynasty Warriors 2. So obviously, all these years later, we're still doing the Battlefield-style games uh, in the U.S. and Europe. So we've always been one number ahead of Japan in terms of game titles. So the newest for us is Dynasty Warriors 9. For Japan, that's actually Dynasty Warriors 8. Um, So if you're still sitting there thinking, too, I don't get what Romance of the Three Kingdoms is. Uh, It's a story that's described as about 70 percent fact and 30 percent fiction about the real period of Chinese history starting around the end of the Han Dynasty, which is around the year 169 A.D. Um, And I, I love how massive this thing is, too. The novel has 120 chapters. It has 1,191 characters and is 800,000 words long. So for comparison, Harry Potter in the Chamber of Secrets is 85,000 words. Uh, The Fellowship of the Ring is 187,000. And the entire Twilight series is 587,000. So Romance of the Three Kingdoms at 800,000 is a really big book. Um, So back to the gaming stuff, though. Dynasty Warriors did great for Koei, uh, who, like I said, mainly focused on strategy games. And they started doing expansions to these games, like expansions we used to get for PC games. And these were called Extreme Legends in the West and uh, usually added new characters and story campaigns and sometimes new game modes. 
Um, and the way that worked, I thought as a kid, was so cool. You put the Extreme Legends disc in the console. You you would buy this disc in stores like you did PC expansions back in the day. Um, so you'd put the disc in your console, and the RAM of the system would save that. And then you take the disc out and put the base game back in, and you get to continue with all the new content. So I thought that was super cool. What what do you think of that, Daniel? Kind of like uh, like the third age, where you have your two discs, and then your content kind of carries over. Yes, very much like that. Gotcha. Okay. Um. So they eventually did more spinoffs, and that brings us to the first Samurai Warriors, which was called Sengoku Muso. Um. So I'm going to speed up a little bit here just to get to that, but. There is uh, also an idea to merge Battlefield and strategy games into the same thing. So we got the Empire series, which is standalone games built on the same engine of each of the previous titles using the same assets. So like Dynasty Warriors 4 got Dynasty Warriors 4 Empires using all the same character models, all the same engine, all the same movesets, all the same everything. Um, And that's something I thought was really interesting because like we talked about in our Pokemon episode with the different versions... If other game companies tried this, I think it would go over really poorly. But Warriors uh, Warriors fans are actually like really into that. And I, I'm into that. Like It doesn't bother me at all. Um, eventually, they made a crossover series with the two that also used the same assets, uh, both Dynasty Warriors and Samurai Warriors. Um, so now each time a Warriors game gets made, we get two pillar games, is what I'm calling them, Dynasty Warriors and Samurai Warriors. And then off of those... We get an expansion for each, and empires for each, and usually a crossover title. Um, but that is until now. Uh, Extreme Legends, apparently these expansions, had some sort of copyright stuff with the technology. Um, so now we get things like Spirit of Sonata, which is uh, just an entirely new spinoff using the same assets as Samurai Warriors 4 and 4-2. So this is a very plot-heavy game. And the story is really, really good. So I'm going to talk about the story a lot and and kind of just go through that. Um, I'd normally say spoiler warning, but the coolest part of the story to me is that all of these things actually happened. Um, since they're all historical, this one starts with uh, the events in the year 1561. Uh, and the game concludes in the year 1615. So spoilers for the story, but also like your history textbooks. Hey, Chris. Yes. How, like, so they're historically accurate, but is there a lot of, like, creative license taken, or is it, like, pretty pretty with it? Pretty with it, but uh, we'll get into that. I've got some of the differences noted as well um, to make sure I hit those, because there's some that the more I dug into it, the more I was like, that's really weird that they decided to change that. Yeah, because I like historical things, but uh, I've noticed that some historical things take the huge grain of salt. So I'm always like, are people like learning like wrong history and then thinking it's real history? And like that, like fascinates me with like historical fiction. So, yes, to some extent, but um, we'll get there. So I've hit the level where just to kind of clue people into as to where this like spiel is coming from. um, I've and I'm sure that you can be like, oh, this is like the weebiest thing ever. But I am really, really invested into the Sengoku era of Japan, um, which translates to the Warring States era. Um, to the point that I've thought about like getting certified as like a history teacher for this. So I'm like really, really into it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so without further ado, you ready to jump into the Warring States era, Daniel? Absolutely. I was born for this. All right. So just to to quickly say to the warring states era happens um basically because you have people in charge called uh the ashikaga family or clan and uh they're the shoguns and they lose a ton of their power all at once and so all these samurai clans at the same time say i should be the new one in charge and when you have all these different factions saying that at the same time what happens is a civil war that has about 20 ish prominent clans participating and roughly 20 sides so stuff gets really complicated when you think about a lot of civil wars for countries you think oh there's two sides for this one there's like 20 plus so uh do you want do you have any feelings about that daniel uh 
I I do. I think it's interesting that our last episode is about Lord of the Rings with the Battle of the Five Armies. And mm. that we've won up to the Battle of Five Armies by jumping to 20. Yes. So not that interesting of a comment, I guess. But turn by turn, we always go bigger. <laughs> yes. I don't know how we're going to go bigger than this, but... So the main plot of the game follows, as the title would suggest, the Sanada clan, which starts with uh, Sanada Masayuki. And I, I will be keeping the names as they are, because that's how I learned them. But like, if you're in a Western country, usually you'd flip the names. So it would be, you know, Sanada would be the, the family name. But in Japan, that comes first. And like I said, since I learned it that way, that's, that's how it's going to be for this. So Sanada Masayuki is a strategist for Takeda Shingen which is one of the most powerful uh, rulers of that time. He's, he's this great warlord. And Masayuki helps the Takeda fight their rivals, the Oesugi clan, a lot during this time. Um, and I'm kind of breezing past this because the game kind of breezes past this. Um, but after a while, Masayuki finds love and has two sons, Sanada Nobuyuki and Yukimura. And they are really, really mega important, more so than like anybody else. We come back to them, but for now they're just babies, so they don't do a whole lot. Um, but the Takeda continue to grow in power under the leadership of Shingen and uh, Masayuki's strategy. And another clan called the Oda start to rise to power as well. And it seems like the Takeda are the only clan who can stop them from eventually ruling all of Japan. So Shingen and Masayuki ride out to fight the Oda's allies, which are called the Tokugawa, who are also pretty powerful. And the duo are able to crush the Tokugawa and invade their territory with about 30,000 men. And you get to play all of this in a really cool way. Um, they have like multi, uh, multi strat, like I forget what they're called, of course. It's like multi level battles. And you do like a part of the battle, and then certain things can go right or wrong for you in that battle. And if you're able to achieve certain conditions, the next phase of the battle has different things happen. Like, if someone dies in the first phase, they won't be around for the second phase. Or if you save them in the first phase, they will be around for the second. So the, the different phases can actually go pretty differently. Um, but to continue along the story, the uh, the Oda overlords come to aid the Tokugawa, and things culminate in what's called the Siege of Noda Castle, where the Takeda men are able to drain the moat of the castle and deprive uh, all of the people inside of their drinking water. So Shingen, being this benevolent guy he is, offers to spare all of the low-ranking troops if they surrender. And he approaches the castle to make this uh, declaration to tell them that. And somebody shoots him with an arrow and he leaves. Um, and I don't think the game shows that, but that's, that's what people think happened. So on the cusp of victory, uh, Shingen gets very, very sick. Um, and the game depicts Masayuki leading the forces instead. Um, he's kind of being the frontline guy, keeping all the troops going and running things. And he's keeping all the uh, the enemies on the ropes. But Shingen's son rides to the front lines to tell Masayuki that his lord has died. Um, historians are actually not sure what happened. Um, they think he got sick, but they don't know with what. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that he died and everything falls apart, and right before victory is theirs, and they conquer pretty much their only obstacle to conquering the entire nation. Uh, the army falls apart, and they have to pack it up and go home. So, sucks sucks for them. Time goes on, and people grieve Lord Shingen, but his son, Takeda Katsuyori, takes up his father's mantle and decides he's going to lead the Takeda instead. Masayuki, being his longtime friend, promises to aid him to whatever end, the Sanada decide to remain loyal to the Takeda. Now, the problem here is that Katsuyori is not his father Shingen. Uh, in fact, Katsuyori absolutely sucks. <laughs> um, he has kind of, an inferior, kind of an inferiority complex because his father was this famous warlord who accomplished all these feats. Um, and so he just spends a lot of time feeling bad about himself, being like, I'm not worthy. And it's your job playing as Masayuki to go talk to him and be like, no, you're great, Katsuyori, it's fine. So during this time that all our main characters are collecting themselves and trying to put things back together, uh, the Oda I mentioned earlier, who almost got defeated, have not been wasting time. 
Their leader, Oda Nobunaga, um, has been talking with the Portuguese traders that have landed in Japan. Um, And a side note for that as well, he actually purchased a black man from them as well, who ends up changing his name to Yasuke, who would go on to become the only black samurai. And I think that's a super cool story if you want to look into it. Um, And he also just got a Netflix special that is ridiculously like fantasy stuff, but it was pretty fun too. So, yeah, that's just kind of a story that intersects with our story and is not featured in this game, but it's there. Is that in a future game in the series? Yes. Um, In Samurai Warriors 5, they ended up talking a lot more about Yasuke and making him a lot more of a prominent. Um, But I I get why he's not in this one. Um, There's so much, like, to, to pause for just a second, the thing that really fascinates me about this era is there is a ton of amazing stories that happen all at the same time. Like, you can't, like it would be impossible to follow all of them at once. So the best way to get into the era is just to pick one person or one family and follow their story all the way through. Kind of like what this game is doing. So Um, this game, are you constantly kind of shifting your role? Like, so so sometimes you're one brother and sometimes you're the other, or do you sort of follow one character specifically? You mostly follow Yuki Mura and Masayuki. Okay. Um, But we'll, we'll get to that. So back to uh, our story with the Oda. Um, He doesn't just buy Yasuke. Um, Nobunaga is a funny man, and he buys these weird little toys that the rest of the Japanese think are silly. And uh, these stupid little toys are called matchlock rifles. (laughs) (laughs) And Nobunaga thinks that they might, just maybe, be useful in battle, potentially. Um, And nobody else really seems to think this. But back to our main characters, Katsuyori is determined to succeed where his father ultimately failed. He wants to reinvade and conquer the Tokugawa and the Oda once and for all to prove himself the greatest leader. Um, The Takeda cavalry this whole time has been seen as invincible, cannot possibly be defeated. And by cavalry, I mean like lots of guys with spears on horses. Um, So there's rumors that this dumb Nobunaga guy that runs the Oda has some fancy newfangled contraption called rifles. Um, But Katsuyori is like, nah, I don't care. We got cavalry. So Katsuyori leads an invasion. And the whole time Masayuki is like, I don't know about this. Probably don't do that. And in fact, for questioning his orders, Masayuki gets demoted to the rear guard, which is a huge dishonor for the samurai. Daniel, I think you could probably spoil this uh, without knowing anything. But the invincible cavalry rides into battle. And shockingly, I know this is hard to believe, um, as it turns out, Rifles beat horses. That stands to reason. I can see that being the case. I know it's shocking. (laughs) Um, It depends on the kind of horse. Like if it was like a futuristic horse with battle armor, maybe not. But it sounds like that's not the case here. So Um, so obviously the Takeda cavalry are gunned down in just a massacre and it goes horribly. And a ton of both the Takeda and Sonata die. Um, Masayuki's relatives, a lot of those are lost in this battle as well, including his two older brothers. And so this is really sad to me, uh, in the way the game presents it, like you're just doing your best, but you're fighting a losing battle and there's not much you can do to turn the tide. Uh, you can't really protect your allies very well because you've got to like stay on the rear guard. It, it sucks. Um, but Katsuyori ends up feeling personally responsible for these failures. And I kind of understand why. But he ends up seeing the end of his clan as inevitable at this point, because that was their main military. So Masayuki demands he comes to stay with the Sanada and fight till the end. Um, But instead, Katsuyori goes to take shelter with a different clan. And Masayuki feels really kind of betrayed by this, that he's like, you know, I've been his trusted friend for forever and he's not going to trust us to to take care of him. Um, But he gets a letter shortly after and realizes that Katsuyori just didn't want to take the Sanada down with him and the Takeda. So that's why he refused to stay with them. He knew that the Oda were going to close in, and that was going to be his end. So he ends up committing seppuku with his wife and son, and leaving the Sanada clan on their own as the Takeda clan ends. So now they have no leader and no direction, because the Sanada clan are just a smaller clan that serves bigger clans. That's, that's really their role in this whole thing. So Masayuki decides to ally himself with whatever guy's currently on his way to the top. So he goes to meet with Oda Nobunaga, the guy that bought rifles earlier. 
and the Sanada become vassals under Nobunaga now, as he still really respects them for their prowess and their strategy. So again, this is not part of our story as much. This is not part of the game as much, but big spoilers for history here. Um, Nobunaga does pretty much conquer all of Japan with everybody helping him. Uh, he becomes the most powerful man in the country, and there's no one left to stop him by the year 1582. So he ends up going to camp at a temple on his way to the capital, where he's going to ascend to become the shogun and become the unequivocal ruler of all Japan. And uh, this this him camping along in this temple uh, on his way there ends up being called the Incident at Hanoji. Um, Nobunaga's right-hand man, Akechi Mits- Mitsuhide, is left in control of the, the Oda army. And Mitsuhide has this idea where he tells all of the army that their enemy is camping at Hanoji, this little temple. So he rides in and burns the place to the ground with the Oda, and Nobunaga is killed in this. There's a lot of fascinating stuff here that I could talk about, but that's, again, a different story. That's that's the Oda story, which is not our story. Mm-hmm. So, the Sanada are once again leaderless and get into a bunch of things I'm going to skip over in the interest of time, but they eventually join up with the Tokugawa, the clan that Shingen almost conquered earlier before he died from illness. So now the Sanada work for them. Um, this is where another new mechanic to the series shows up, and that's aging. Up to this point, um, Nobuyuki and Yukimura have been running around, but they've been little kids. This is uh, Masayuki's kids that I mentioned earlier. Um, but here, because the story is progressing, they age up into young adults, and now they get to participate in the story more. And uh, that that was very new to the series. We've never had aging characters before. It was just what you were was what you were. So a lot of this part of the game follows. Uh, it's centered around like the ninja characters, which I'm not going into into too much um, because that's again a whole other story to get into that we just don't have time for. But uh, I'll talk about them a little bit. Um, the Sonata do use ninja. Ninja were real. That was a thing. And their ninja is named uh, Konoichi, which drives me nuts because the f- a, a female ninja, the name for a female ninja is a Konoichi. So it's really weird. Like It's like naming a dog, dog. <laughs> uh, I don't know if that kind of stuff bothers you, Daniel. Uh, no, I'm generally pretty flexible with stuff. Oh, I don't know. It bothers me because it's like her name. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I do love her as a character and how hard she works, and uh, she's really, really useful for the entire game because the ninja in the game are very, very fast, and there's nothing to debuff them. Like They're not weaker than everybody else because they're faster. They're just really fast and also really strong. Um, And she's also super available in terms of usability, like tons and tons and tons of missions you can use her on. And... uh, that ends up getting you levels really quick, and so she becomes really, really strong. Um, the other ninja you get to use is uh, Sarutobi Sasuke, which uh, to the kids of Japan is a legendary ninja, and like everybody knows who Yukimura's sidekick is. Um, to them, I, the only equivalent I could think of is sort of like knowing who Batman is. Like he's that big to Japanese pop culture. Uh, is this is this a character that you know of, Daniel? Uh, I'm not really familiar with any of these characters, to be totally honest. Mm, But his name has become so synonymous with ninja. If I say Sasuke, even my mom thinks of a ninja. It's the Naruto one, but it is still a ninja. Yeah, I do do think of Sasuke. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) that that would be who he's named after. From Naruto. Naruto? Naruto. Naruto. Anyway. I was just going to let you keep going. (laughs) (laughs) We don't have time for that. (laughs) Um... I liked Sasuke as a character in this game, but uh, I actually hated his moveset so much I dreaded using him. Mm -hmm. It just is really... um, His moveset has a ton of movement to it, and so like it's really difficult to actually focus on any one enemy you're trying to kill, and it gets really annoying. Um, As far as how Sasuke is in real life, this is another one of the ones where I I said I'd talk about some divergences in history. Um, historians actually argue if Sasuke is even based on a real person, um, but the character overall is considered to be fictional. Um, Kono- uh, Konoichi is definitely based on a group of real ninja that were loyal to the Takeda clan, so that one's not too much of a stretch. Like, I think that she probably existed, they just condensed a lot of 
she was not one person. She was like a whole group of people that they've now condensed for the game into one person. Is this, is that character sort of, um, this is a kind of random tangent, but is that like group sort of based on, um, oh, I'm going to butcher it. In Avatar, there's like um, some like earthbender women that are kind of like ninjas. Is there any sort of tie in there? Um, Do you mean the ones with like painted faces? Yeah. Um, kind of potentially, I, I think that they were maybe based a little bit on this idea, um, spirit, but not the same logistics. Yes. Because there's also like, we won't get into it too much cause family friendly show, but, um, the Kanoichi and really all the ninja are not so much. Um, it's not like Naruto. You don't see them fighting on the front lines very often. Um, they really are the more typical like we move in the shadows we do things um it would be like covert agents and things gotcha so a konoichi's job might be very much to um infiltrate like an enemy camp and seduce their leader or something and get him to spill his secrets to her um during some sort of romantic encounter Uh, um and then depending on what her mission is she may or may not poison him or something like that to take him out so you, you wouldn't see them like the Avatar characters, which very much are on the uh, on the front lines of battle. But I think the spirit is definitely the same. Um, so jumping back to our, our main story, uh, the Tokugawa asked Masayuki to consider or sorry, to construct a grand castle, um, which he does. And he calls this Ueda Castle and the Sanada establish it as their new home. Um, and so this is a really big deal for them. They, they, for the first time have their own giant castle that they're running. And very quickly, the leader of the Tokugawa, Ieyasu, makes a treaty with a rival clan and negotiates that castle away and orders the Sanada to leave their home and move somewhere else. Okay. Uh, huh? Okay. <laughs> Masayuki says, no. <laughs> Um, Yukimura kind of freaks out and is like, dad, we've like bounced around allegiances a lot in that little time period I skipped over. He's like, you can't keep doing this. Um, he wants his dad to actually be loyal to someone because Yukimura really prizes loyalty highly. Um, but Masayuki strikes up a partnership with the Oesugi clan who they used to be at war with. And, uh, he sends Yukimura to go live with them as a hostage to protect against betrayal. That way, you know, Yuki, uh, they know Masayuki's not going to betray them if they've got Yukimura living with them, because then they'll just kill him off. Um, and we get a really important scene here with the two brothers, Yuki, uh, Yukimura and Nobuyuki. Um, they meet on the bridge outside away to castle, and their symbol for their clan is six coins. And that represents the cost that you have to pay to get into the afterlife. And so Yukimura's brother meets him on his way out of town and gives him three coins. Um, to which Yukimura says, this is not going to be enough to get me there. And Nobuyuki just responds, then you better not die yet. <laughs> and he's got the other three coins. And so it's just kind of this great moment that kind of bonds the two brothers together. So the uh, the Oesugi clan, when they take Yukimura as a hostage, they actually treat him like their son. And uh, they're super kind to him, and it goes really well. And this is really important, uh, and they're really important as allies, because the Tokugawa did not like being told no. So they decide to invade away to castle and take it by force. So they send 7,000 men to go do that. And the Sanada have 1,200 men. Um, and incredibly, the Sanada clan wins, and the clan that the away to castle was promised to, the Hojo, um, decide to invade next. And they get defeated as well. And you get to play all this out, which is really fun. Um, And this moves Masayuki away from being seen as more of a retainer to like a full-fledged warlord now. We're we're kind of graduating as the Sanada from the small clan that serves other clans to we're kind of the big big name now. Um, would, Would this be a good spot to go to break? Let me see. Yeah, we can go to break here. I think that'll be okay. Thank you all for tuning in so far. I hope you're enjoying learning about some history stuff alongside some gaming stuff. And uh, please enjoy these ads from 6.5 Media and check out some of these other fine shows that we're about to pitch to you right now. Bye. Bye. 
Have you ever been looking for a definitive Nintendo ranking and can't seem to find it because it's just everybody's own opinion? Honestly, all the time, Sam. Well, I'm looking for someone to give us the answers. Wait, you mean like a podcast made by two young, handsome men where they create a definitive top five list of all things Nintendo? Should we just do it ourselves? Yeah, that sounds fantastic. Let's give it a shot. I'm Sam. And I'm Jake. And, and at, at Top, top 5, 5 Nintendo, Nintendo, I'm going to give you my top five list. And I'm going to give you my top five list. And then we're going to duke it out and see what the real top five is. Hey, this is Jordan Johnson, and I'm Max Olmsted, and we're at the Top Hat Balloon Show here. Yeah, so it's a sketch comedy show, and it's a complete secret to everyone. Yeah, it's a super secret. It comes out weekly, but only you can know about it. Yes, you're one of the special few who we're telling about it. Yeah, so make sure you go to YouTube, iTunes, or our website, TopHatBalloonShow.com. Yeah, and watch our videos and subscribe, but don't tell anyone. Well, <laughs> tell some people. Maybe tell some people. Maybe a few folks. Maybe... Maybe you only tell, like, each of you only tell 20 people each. Yes. Then then it'll still be small and cool, but... Yeah, yeah but it's a secret, okay? Yeah. It's a secret. Keep that in okay. mind. The secret Tom Eppelin show, okay? Goodbye. We are back. I am still here, and Chris will continue the lesson. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so um, when we went to break, we were celebrating that the Sonata had just become a major clan and didn't need to be subservient to the other clans anymore. Um, so Masayuki immediately does that again and becomes subservient to another clan. <laughs> um, so there's another rising star called Toyotomi Hideyoshi, who used to serve under Nobunaga Oda, if you remember that. Yukimura is again also given as a hostage this time to the Toyotomi. Um, and he, again, Hideyoshi and his wife, Nene, uh, treat Yukimura as a son, uh, again, which I, I think is really cool. And uh, Nene, Hideyoshi's wife, despite having a funny name, um, is another one of... Bleh. She is another of my favorite characters from the whole period. Um, she can't have kids, but she treats all their generals, who I also love as characters, as her children. Um, she's also a, a Kanoichi, a female ninja, and uh, despite being like a politician's wife, you know, which in that time you could have sat around doing not much, but she's a capable ninja. And also several times when Hideyoshi gets sick or is out of commission, she actually ends up running things and does a really good job. Um, but anyway, uh, Hideyoshi officially promotes the Sonata clan to being like a more major clan. Um and then immediately designates them to aid the Tokugawa in military matters. So the guys that we just betrayed because they told us to give away away to Castle, we now serve them again. <laughs> it, it really blows me away how interconnected all these stories are. Like, you can pick your favorite characters. Like, you, if you pick two totally different characters, they will... And, and again, these are real people. This is not, like, Koei setting this up or something with writers. Like, these people really did come into contact with each other multiple times, sometimes as allies, sometimes as enemies. Um, so Yukimura starts to worry again that his father is not going to be happy serving under their enemy, now ally, then enemy, back and forth and back and forth. Um, but Masayuki knows better, and he suspects that Hideyoshi is using the Sanada to keep an eye on the more ambitious Tokugawa Ieyasu. Masayuki volunteers to travel to meet with the Tokugawa and to show good faith. And oh wait, yeah, he sends Nobuyuki, sorry. He sends Nobuyuki to go meet them, because if Masayuki goes to meet them, he's worried it's going to be seen as like trying to intimidate them. So he sends his son Nobuyuki, and Nobuyuki goes to meet with the uh, Tokugawa, and it's it's all going pretty well. And he is shocked when Ieyasu brings up uh, Ina, which is the daughter of his right-hand man. And Ieyasu says he intends to adopt Ina formally into his family, and then he wants her to marry Nobuyuki. So the Sanada and the Tokugawa are now one. What, what do you think of that twist? It's So is each game that's released sort of from another angle of this like overarching narrative? No, this is the first one that's been really focused in on one family. Gotcha. Um, okay. But each, each game takes like different bits and puts different emphasis on different families and different perspectives. Okay. Cause what I was wondering was you had mentioned kind of like other groups that were kind of coexisting at the same time. So I wasn't sure if other games took, 
took their stories and kind of ran with them. It, it does. Um, a lot of the other games, you get to pick uh, which family you want to play as, and you go through the, their whole story wherever it starts and wherever it ends. Yes, Nobuyuki and Ina do get married, and the Sanada and Tokugawa are merged. Here's another thing that gets really different in from history versus the game. So Hideyoshi is a little bit weird in Samurai Warriors in that he's portrayed as a, this kind and benevolent ruler who did a lot of good for Japan, uh, which is all true to an extent. But there are some things that are skipped over in every single Samurai Warriors game that took me a long time to learn about. Um, Hideyoshi does conquer all of Japan and he brings peace to the land, which is great. And Samurai Warriors is happy enough to leave it at that. Um, but here's where real history comes in. Samurai Warriors usually is just like, and he served for a long time, and they just kind of do a, and a little bit later, some other things happen. Um, but in that little bit later, in that time skip, um, there's actually an entire other military campaign that happens that I thought was fascinating. So Hideyoshi realizes he's got all these samurai around who have no more battles to fight because he's conquered all of Japan. He's been crowned Shogun. He, he's everything. But he knows that peace can't last when there's all these soldiers around that can't work. So he needs something for all these soldiers to do. So he sets his sights on China and asks Korea for the ability to pass through to conquer China. Uh, Korea says no, because they worry that China is going to march out to meet the threat and meet the samurai in battle. And then Korea will become the battlefield. So they're like, nah, dog, you're not doing that. <laughs> um, so Hideyoshi then launches a full-scale invasion of Korea, and it goes pretty well at first. Um, they have good momentum, but as they get deeper and deeper into Korea, it gets really hard for supply lines to go that far. Um, and so this all becomes really, really difficult. But around this same time, Hideyoshi starts to go a little bit insane. And again, Samurai Warrior skips over that as well. Uh, and historians don't know exactly what his deal was. They think maybe he got sick. Maybe he had some mental illness things going on. We're not sure. Um, but he doesn't actually care that things start going poorly. And anytime a general brings him bad news, he punishes the general. Um, then another thing that skipped over is Hideyoshi starts to have a problem with succession. Um, and I forget the exact uh, reason for this. It's like... He is, I think, having trouble producing an heir because, like I said before, his wife can't have children. So his brother has a son, and Hideyoshi's like, well, I'll adopt that guy, that kid so that then he will become my heir. Then Hideyoshi has an heir from a second wife. And so now he's like, well, now I've got this nephew that I've adopted, and I don't want him to be my heir anymore, but this is a problem. So he ends up sending his nephew into exile, and orders him to commit suicide, and lots of people die from the, these events. Uh, then he decides Christianity is not a good thing for Japan, so he starts to crucify the Christians to prevent the spread of Christianity. Samurai Warriors goes ahead and skips over all this. <laughs> <laughs> um, then, Daniel, what do you think happens next? Uh, it seems like it might be about time for them to be taken over again. Um well, then Hideyoshi decides to invade Korea again. Okay. Uh, this time there is no good momentum at all. It just goes terribly. <laughs> and the only thing you need to know from this part for our story is that the invasion, uh, the military leader of the invasion, his name is Kobayakawa Hideaki. And so just remember that name and I'll, I'll help you when it's relevant again. So Hideyoshi keeps getting sicker and eventually dies. And the game shows that part. He It's just like some things happen. He rules peacefully and then he gets sick and dies. But in real life, his generals actually kept his death a secret for a few days and signed his name on an order to end the Korean invasion first. They, they just knew that had to be done. And then they announced he died. <laughs> because <laughs> they're like we know this is going horribly and this can't keep going um so the game picks up again with his death and hideyoshi leaves his son in charge who is named hideyori uh so hideyori is now the supreme power in japan and he is five years old any thoughts on that um there was probably a lot of policies concerning blocks and do dolls <laughs> instituted at said time <laughs> That's one would think <laughs> So this is where the peace in Japan once again gets complicated. There's a lot of capable warriors and leaders in Japan. Not all of them are super keen on taking orders from a five-year-old. So whispers start up about something happening, and war is once again in the air. No one's quite sure what's going to happen, though. 
uh, Tokugawa Ieyasu, who served Nobunaga, Oda, and then uh, the Toyotomi under Hideyoshi. He was on uh, Hideyoshi's inner council, and he steps forward and says he should rule. He's destined to do, to do this, uh, and this is his chance. And the Tokugawa get opposed by Ishida Mitsunari, who is the leader of the government side of things under Hideyoshi. He's kind of the bureaucrat guy. And uh, a number of... Uh, he's he's also the same... in Part of that same inner council. Um, and Mitsunari says he wants to be loyal to Hideyoshi's name and wants to fight uh, so that he rules until Hideyoshi's child is old enough to rule, at which point he will pass it to Hideyoshi's son. The uh, Tokugawa have no... No such ambitions. They're like, nah, we're just going to get rid of the five-year-old. <laughs> so the Sanada clan, once again, has a choice to make. Yukimura has been living with Hideyoshi this entire time and is like a son to him now. Nobuyuki, his brother, is married to the Tokugawa's daughter and is now like a son to the Tokugawa. You see where this is going. So the family has a meeting. The Sanada family has a meeting. And Masayuki decides he's going to side with uh, Mitsunari. The dad decides he's siding with Mitsunari because it'll benefit the Sanada more if they win because Mitsunari is not seen as the favorite to win. Nobuyuki decides he is siding with Ieyasu and the Tokugawa because he believes in them and feels that Mitsunari should just stop fighting and we'd have peace. Like, if you want peace, just don't fight and then we'll have it. Uh, Yukimura is horribly bothered by this, um, but his father tells him, we each followed our convictions and made our decisions. You must do the same. So Yukimura decides to side with Mitsunari as well. It's where his friends are. It's sort of an adopted family to him. And he, like I said earlier, really prizes loyalty. Uh, this, is, this is one of Yukimura's defining character traits, that he loves the people around him really deeply and just can't handle not being loyal to them. So tensions keep escalating, and it becomes clear that there is going to be another war. So we get the Western forces, led by Mitsunari, and he's got a bunch of different uh, characters that you'll have met already with him. And uh, they move to a camp in a giant field surrounded by mountains. And this is really famous in Japanese history and is called Sekigahara. And the Eastern forces are now led by the Tokugawa and Ieyasu. Um, and they have Nobuyuki and a bunch of the other fam uh, characters you've met at this point as well. Um, pretty much the entire roster divides in half. And instead of the 20 sides, the 20 sides all kind of converge and we've just got two. Mm -hmm. um, but Ieyasu's forces, the Tokugawa forces, are split into two large groups. Uh, the Tokugawa's son, Hide Tada, is leading a large chunk of the army right by Ueda Castle. Uh, the, the, that giant castle that the Sanada own. So Yukimura and Masayuki have another decision to make here. Hide Tada is walking by with about 38,000 troops, and the Sanada have about 3,500. You have any guess what uh, what they decide to do? Uh, probably just pack it up and live a quiet life. Fishing, farming. Yeah, so of course, okay. they, they decide to fight that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, a scribe for the Tokugawa at the time wrote, Our army has been defeated badly, and we've had countless casualties. The result is that uh, when the war starts, the Sanada are so effective in fighting this part of the Tokugawa army that Hide Tada and his men are not there to, at the main battle when it starts. Um, this is a great level to play in the game, because, I mean, it's just super difficult, and it's like you don't totally need to win, you just need to live. Um, so while that's going on, at, back at that field at Sekigahara, the big battle starts between Mitsunari and Ieyasu. And Mitsunari starts crushing it. Uh, the Tokugawa are having a lot of trouble, and it comes time for Mitsunari's plan to finish the battle. Uh, he stationed a large force up on the mountain, at the top of the mountain, and told them to wait for a signal, and then ride down on horses to finish off the Tokugawa. The man who is leading those forces, uh, do you remember his name? Um, how about you tell me just so I don't... That's fine. Butcher it. Uh, Kobayakawa Hideaki is the man sitting at the front of those forces leading them. Mm hmm So this was the guy that led that second invasion of Korea. So now is the time to mention that Hideaki during that time had some pretty heroic feats. Um, but Hideyoshi saw some of his feats he did as brash and thought, even though he gets results, I can't have this general that just flies off the handle and does these things. It was stuff like uh, if a bunch of men were pinned down and were not going to survive, it's like, well, strategically, the thing to do would be to let them die and pull back to save the rest of the army. 
Hideaki wasn't that kind of guy. He was like, I'm going to go save them and risk the rest of the army, but it always works out. But Hideyoshi's like, I can't have somebody leading like that. So he actually demotes him and uh, punishes him a lot. And so Hideaki hears a rumor that was started by the Tokugawa that the guy in charge of the bureaucrats, Ishida Mitsunari, who is Hideyoshi's advisor at the time, um, had suggested that he be punished for all these things because he was jealous. So now all of Mitsunari's hopes and dreams are depending on Hideaki. But Hideaki has also gotten a letter from Ieyasu telling him that he should turn traitor and fight for the Western Army when the time comes. So the time comes to end the battle and Mitsunari gives that signal. And Hideaki does nothing. And so Ieyasu expects Hideaki to ride down and kill Mitsunari. And Hideaki does and it becomes clear to both sides pretty quickly that Hideaki plans to just watch this entire thing play out more until a winner is going to be decided, and then he'll ride down and kill whoever is not the clear winner. Uh, Ieyasu is not impressed with this, and he orders his men to just start shooting at Hideaki's forces to force him to make a choice. And uh, he does decide. Hideaki charges down into Mitsunari's forces, and Ieyasu wins. Tons of our main characters uh, that we've been seeing a lot are hunted down and killed, but Sanada Nobuyuki is on the winning side, so that's good for us, at least a little bit. So historians wonder a little bit why the Sanada split the way they did, which sides they were on. Um, and it could have been exactly as the game depicts. Um, but some also think it was just a plan to ensure the survival of their family. That way, they, you know, they were kind of playing both sides. And no matter which side won, the family would still come out on top. Um, but anyway, Ieyasu is incredibly angry that Masayuki and Yukimura delayed uh, a chunk of his forces. Um, but Nobuyuki begs forgiveness for them. Uh, and Hide Tada, the... Uh, the actual biological son of Ieyasu ends up begging for forgiveness for them as well. And Ieyasu does relent. And he, instead of executing them all, exiles our main character, Yukimura, to Mount Kudo and tells him to just live in exile as farmers. So it took a little while, but we actually did get to your suggestion, Daniel, that where they're just going to fish and farm. <laughs> um, and they do. And it really, for what they did, is not a bad deal. Mm -hmm. Like, you almost cost this guy everything. And your only punishment is to pack up and go live with your family in the mountains and live out the rest of your days in solitude. People like it's, would like kill for that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not that bad. Oueda Castle, you know, their castle that they had to pack up and leave um, is actually bestowed to Nobuyuki. So even that stays in the family. It really is pretty best case scenario. Um, then we get to that five year old who is now seven years old. Everybody tells Ieyasu, you've got to kill this kid. Like, to, to settle all this, you have to kill him. And Ieyasu says, I feel weird killing a seven-year-old. I'm not going to do that. Which, again, is another very big deal at the time that most other rulers would have been like, yep, okay, he's dead. But Ieyasu is not that kind of guy, so he says no. Um, but that also comes with whispers that Hideyori, the, the kid, is still the rightful leader of Japan, despite Ieyasu now being named Shogun and taking full control of Japan again. So things are quiet for a number of years, and our main characters just sit on Mount Kudo, and we get kind of another time skip here. But Yukimura starts to wonder about how his friends are doing that were a part of the Toyotomi. So 14 years after he was in exile, he gets on a horse and rides for the old capital of Osaka, where the Toyotomi still live. He runs into some of his old, uh, some of the old generals when he gets there that actually sided with Ieyasu during the fight. And no one is mad about it. They all realize each of them did the best they could with what they had. Um, and I really like the characters he ends up meeting with. Uh, Kato Kiyamasa and Fukushima Masanori. It's more the generals that like were treated as kids by Hideyoshi and his wife. Um, and the three swear to do their best for the Toyotomi in the future. And then the game immediately hits you with a subtitle that says Kiyomasa would soon get sick and die, and the other guy, Masanori, would be suspected of being disloyal and would be stripped of all his ranks and powers. So they are not going to help you. Yukimura rides home, this time determined that he's not going to stay in exile. Um, while he's spending time again at Mount Kudo, uh, Masayuki peacefully passes away. He's confident that Nobuyuki is doing a good job protecting the clan, and he's still sad after all these years that he failed his friends in the Takeda back all those years ago. Um, and he kind of feels like Yubi Yukimura and Nobuyuki are the two sides of a coin. That Nobuyuki is making the smart decisions to preserve the family, preserve the clan, and Yukimura is living out the 
what it means to be a sonata. He's living out the spiritual side and the ambitions. Shortly after this, there's word that the Tokugawa army is on the move. So Yukimura uh, gets aged up again to a full adult with that same kind of new weird aging mechanic. Um, and he rides back to Osaka Castle to stand with the Toyotomi in this final conflict. Um, and before it was kind of a stealth mission, this time he doesn't try to hide it. He just goes and goes straight to uh, the woman who's in charge now, who is called Lady Cha-Cha. And I've not mentioned her up to this point because um, that's another really weird whole plot line. But um, Samurai Warriors, they depict her as being kind of Hideyoshi's adopted daughter. And she has kind of this romance with Yukimura the whole time. And it's it's pretty moving. I think they did a pretty good job with it. Um, but in reality, when I started looking into this, because, of course, I was like, well, did they ever get married? Um, in reality, she was actually married to Hideyoshi as his second wife. And uh, there are not records that I could find of her and Yukimura even knowing each other very well. So you were talking about learning alternate history things. There, there's one for you. Um, so anyway, Cha-Cha is now in charge um, because Hideyoshi's son is still a kid. And Yukimura attends a war council and is overruled. The plan is to hole up in the castle and pray their defenses hold. Yukimura thinks this is a really dumb idea. And instead, he rallies what men and resources he can to start constructing what's called the Sanada Maru. And this is essentially a makeshift fort they build outside the castle in front of the castle to protect the castle. Um, and some of the other men think this is a really dumb idea. Um, but they lure the Tokugawa army inside this thing and start shifting walls around and shooting them with rifles. So it just becomes this giant maze that none of them can get out of. Um, and amazingly, it starts. they start winning. So at the start, it was 200,000 Tokugawa men versus 100,000 Toyotomi men, which is not great odds, obviously. But Ieyasu also, I think very wisely, left Nobuyuki at home and lots of the other officers that used to work for the Toyotomi. He didn't want anybody working on this one that was potentially had a conflict of interest. Yukimura leads an offensive and begins to push in on the Tokugawa main camp. But then, uh, similar to our story with the Oda all those years ago, the Tokugawa rolled out these new contraptions called cannons. <laughs> and uh, they start blasting at Osaka Castle, which really freaks people out because they haven't they have really seen cannons before. Yeah, I don't know what I would think. Um, so it's another another uh, situation where this castle is seen as invincible, um, but then these cannon things do a lot of damage really fast. And uh, in her fear, Lady Cha-Cha quickly signs a peace accord with the Tokugawa, so the battle just suddenly ends. Uh, a lot of the men get really angry because they feel like they actually would have won if she hadn't done that. Um, and these are all things historians still debate today, like who would have won. Um, but the people knew that this would not be the end of it. The heir of the Toyotomi is still alive, and so are the Tokugawa. And everyone knows there can only be one at the end of the day. So it becomes pretty clear there's going to be one more battle. Yukimura leaves the castle by himself in the dead of night and goes to meet with Nobuyuki one more time. They show that they both still have their coins that they got back years ago. And Yukimura apologizes for forcing his brother to live such a tough life without the support of his family. We also get a glossary entry shortly after that tells us Nobuyuki actually had been sending money to his father and his brother the entire time they were in exile. So he's really just been the, the uber family man. Yukimura comes back after meeting with his brother and Cha-Cha gets really angry at him. She kind of sent him to go meet with his brother, hoping that he would escape and keep living. But obviously, like I said, he, his main trait is loyalty. So he comes back and is like, well, I serve you, so I'm going to keep doing that. So it's pretty well known at this point that they're all going to die. Instead of facing up to that, Yukimura says, I will fight for victory and make sure you don't lose hope. And she's like, I have no hope. What are you talking about? And he goes, well, you haven't surrendered yet. So you've got something. And she's like, well, I guess. And then as he's leaving for battle, he says, like, we, sh we should really go for a vacation after this, like somewhere a lot warmer and starts talking about, like, some of the islands and things that they should go see. So the battle before this one was called the Osaka Winter Campaign. And it's remembered as that because there's an Osaka Summer Campaign that starts now. So the Tokugawa march all the way back with 150,000 men. And the Toyotomi are down to 50,000 now because of the losses of the last battle and also because, you know, they all know that they're going to die. So a lot of people leave. Um, but everybody that stays, all parties involved are pretty clear on what's about to happen. 
Uh, and the castle is still damaged from cannon fire. They have not had time to repair it. So Yukimura resolves that the only thing to do is to just ride out and meet them head on in the field because the castle is not going to provide any defense this time. You know, you keep thinking like, well, it'd be a great story if they won and stuff, but the battle goes exactly as it's predicted to. You get to watch all your allies give their all and get struck down one by one. Yukimura does his best to fight the good fight, but it just isn't enough, and eventually he is also mortally wounded. Uh, he gives his three coins to his ninja, Kanoichi, and finally dies. I cried. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's hard when a character really touches you and then dies, but to me it's even harder when my normal coping mechanism is I go, well, it's not real, it's whatever. Um, but these are real people who died for real and really did these things. And that just moves me so much more. Like, I just, I can't believe that that's how that goes. Listeners, he's crying right now. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'm good for right now. But I did tear up a little bit in writing some notes for the episode because I went back and rewatched a lot of it. Um, after that, we get a shot of Osaka Castle, the castle he was defending, uh, burning to the ground with Lady Cha-Cha inside. And that's where the credits roll. Um, that's we the end do. of the game? Huh? <laughs> that's the end of the game, or dying in the castle? The last shot is her standing on the balcony of the castle as the flames get bright, brighter and brighter, and then it shifts to a like long shot of the castle as it crumbles. Well, that's that's pretty terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, what else were they going to end on? You know, that is where Yukimura's story ends, and he is the main character. Got to um, end in there. We do get an after credit scene of Nobuyuki looking at the moon and he hears a small sound behind him and turns around to see that Yukimura's coins have been set on the ground. So he picks those up and just kind of has a moment with himself. And uh, to give you listeners a little bit of a, a better epilogue, um, with that last battle, peace is brought to Japan and the whole Warring States era comes to an end. And now we're in the year 1615. And so the whole the whole thing is over. Um, and there's a nice epilogue, too, when you get back to the main menu. It says, like, continue on or something. And you get to play as Nobuyuki and go back home to Ueda Castle and see everyone. Um, and even the, your home before Ueda Castle. He invites Yukimura's ninja Konoichi to stick around since she's pretty much family at this point. Um, he gets to talk to his little sister, who I didn't mention this whole time, but Yukimura and Nobuyuki also have a little sister that just kind of sits at home the whole time. Um, and he apologizes to her for splitting the clan, but she corrects him and asks if they were ever actually split at all, because even if you take different life paths, family is still family at the end of the day. Um, as you continue exploring the different uh, locations, you get to hear the kids in the village and villages and towns you visit singing songs about Yukimura and the sacrifice he makes. Um, and then it, t it goes ahead and shows you the end of the sonata here, how that en the story ends for them. So Ieyasu is now passed away, and his son Hide Tada um, is now the shogun. And he calls for a meeting with Nobuyuki to discuss a rumor that's been circulating. The rumor is that Hide Tada purposefully delayed his forces in that battle that he fought against Yukimura and Masayuki um, before that giant battle against uh, Mitsunari. He, the, the rumor is that he delayed his forces on purpose because he wanted to eventually overthrow his father. And that's why Yukimura and Masayuki got to go into exile instead of being executed, because they were all in on it. Um, so Nobuyuki tells him he knows what needs to be done to squash those rumors, and they do need to be squashed. Otherwise, someone's going to rise up and say they're a Tokugawa loyalist and wage war on Hide Tada, and we're going to start this whole thing over again. So Nobuyuki tells Hide Tada to just go ahead and strip them of their lands and force their family to move, and he promises to act outraged about it because he, he feels like Yukimura died for, for this peace that we have, and his dad died for this peace that they have. And so all of this ends up being for nothing, and we start back into civil wars. It's just going to desecrate their memory. So the game portrays this as really hard for Hide Tada, who also thinks of Nobuyuki as a brother now. But he goes through with it and strips the Sonata of their lands and pretty much all their power and forces them to move. Um, and then he's Shogun for another year and retires under the pressure of it all and passes it on to his son. And so that's the end of, of the story. <laughs> what do you think, Daniel? That feels like a dynasty worth of game. 
Yeah, um, and uh, if you guys want to experience this in another way, this game was made in conjunction with um, a, a company called NHK, which makes uh, what are called taiga dramas, and they're historical dramas that last for a year in Japan. Um, you get like an episode a week, and so there's like 50-something episodes every year. I think it's like, it might be 50 exactly. Um, but they're, uh, they're special. Their historical drama for the year was... Um, about the life and times of Yuki Murasanada. So you can go watch all of that in live action if you want to. Um, I've watched some clips of it. It's pretty cool. But uh, overall, I, I want kind of your thoughts, Daniel. What do you what do you think of the story? I think it sounds really good. It feels like there's a, lo- a lot to kind of swallow and digest here. Um, as far as like the gameplay goes, it's obviously not like a turn-based RPG, but is it is it more like an ARPG where you're kind of hacking slashing around and you have stats and things it's very much hack and slash uh where you have stats and things um there's also this is the first game that has a hub world where you do lots of talking with people you take quests um and side quests um there's a a farming thing where you plant plant crops um you get to fish and you have to craft items and stuff so this is the first one that introduced more rpg elements actually so as far as like the story like how much of that are you watching versus playing? Like, is it sort of like the story is happening within the fights or is it more? Yes. Okay. There's a lot of that. Um, there's also cutscenes and things for major, major moments and uh, lots of talking as well. Just like, I don't know, th- not rendered cutscenes, but in engine cutscenes for a lot of these as well um, for a lot of the quiet moments. But if it happens in battle and stuff, it will happen in that battle. Gotcha. So in the battles where your characters lose, like how does how do the objectives work for that? Is it like um, a lot of the times after twenty minutes, or like how how is that set up? Sometimes it's just survive. Sometimes it's you need to kill a certain amount of enemies to make it out of this. Sometimes it's um, your your allies, which are controlled by the AI, are trying to retreat, and you need to go cover their retreat and make sure that like at least five of them escape the battle. So that's, really that's, cool. that's kind of how that works. And then also battle conditions change all the time. Like it might be like your mission is to uh, there's one that it's like your mission is to get to this area. And then the enemy army is like destroys a dam and it floods half the battlefield. And it's like, OK, new plan. <laughs> like gotcha. we, we can't go to that area anymore because it's underwater now. So does it and like this is a little bit of a stretch, but I understand, but. Is it kind of like Star Wars Battlefront where you have like your your player character and then you have like an army around you that are also sort of like a, an NPC army with you? Yes. I don't oh. think that's a stretch at all. Um, oh. I actually that's how I got into this whole series. I was playing a lot of Star Wars Battlefront 2 on the PS2. Yeah. And I then uh, I went to a friend's house and he had uh, Dynasty Warriors 4. And I was like, oh, my gosh, this is just star wars battlefront but with swords and spears like this is great so i i think it's very very similar okay well i'm I'm definitely sold i i'd like to check it out um so is this primarily not available on switch um much to my frustration it is in japan but not anywhere else ah so your your options for spirit of sonata are either pc or uh ps4 right now gotcha. but they're getting better about it um you can get samurai warriors 5 and play that on your switch anywhere and samurai warriors 5 i'll, I'll go ahead and shill that to you for a minute that one is another uh hyper focused story on just a family and that one focuses on the oda and so you get more of their side of things um but i'm also a little bit frustrated with it because it was a soft reboot and so they changed a lot of the character designs and kind of restarted on the roster. And I didn't appreciate that very much, but it is still a great game. And uh, the story is obviously, I think, really, really great. Um, the story as a whole, I also really got into because I used to be a really big uh, sucker for the Star Wars expanded universe before Disney took it over. And... This had a lot of those qualities to me, even though it's real life, which I know people at home are like, what? Um, But hear me out. The thing I got out of the Star Wars Expanded Universe was I appreciated 
anytime there's a character in one of the Star Wars movies, like, you know, maybe you see a guy walk by in the background, there's an entire novel out there telling you what that guy was up to. And so it just felt like a very lived in world where everybody's doing something all the time. Um, That's how that used to feel to me. And this has that same feel in that, you know, we, we just followed the Sonata story through this whole era. But like the Oda have their own story that takes them through this whole era that is very different. And even though it's a little bit shorter, because I, I told you where they end, there's so many more twists and turns that I didn't go through that are part of their story. Um, and it's the same with Hideyoshi. Hideyoshi has tons and tons of things that are with him. And then there's all these other people that serve under them. Like um, another of my favorites that just was not at all present in this story is a uh, Tachibana Ginshio, and she is a um, one of the few, very few samurai who's a woman. And her father dies very, very when she's very young, and she's his only child. And so all the retainers he has are like, "Well, who's he going to appoint? What man is he going to appoint?" And he's like, "I only have a daughter, and she's like seven, and I'm going to appoint her anyway." And then surprisingly, it goes okay, and she ends up being a pretty good leader from a very young age. Um, and so she's got her whole story through this. And like I said, that one's she doesn't really intersect with the Sonata very much. So she just is not mentioned at all here. I think you see her husband a couple of times in this game. Um, just kind of he's on the battlefield. He's running around. But uh, I don't think he says much. But each one of those like 20 plus sides has its own like completely unique story. And uh, you, you also might wonder how different are all the games? Um, how, you know, how many ways can this be interpreted? And the answer is surprisingly a lot. <laughs> um, they also have like there's a Samurai Warriors anime series that you can watch if you're you're into that, if you're so inclined. Um, another of their competitors is Sengoku Basara is what it's called. And that's made by Capcom. And uh, they've got like four games or five games and uh, also have their own anime series complete with movies. That's really fun. So there's all kinds of things to get you into the era if you if you ever want to give it a shot. And I would love to talk with you on social media about it at any time. You got anything else for this one, Daniel? Any any more questions about the warrior stuff or the era or the story or gameplay or anything like that? I think I'm at the point where I need to play it and then maybe we can do... Maybe I'll try to get that number five and play that, and then we can do like a kind of a follow up. Yeah, that'd be good. Either that or um, another great package that I would love to cover um, is Dynasty Warriors 8 uh, Complete Edition is on the Switch and is regularly on sale. It's on the eShop. Um, and that would be another really great starting point, I would say, for people to get on board with uh, the Warriors thing. And that one's about China. Um, which I think is slightly less interesting, but only very slightly. It's still a really, really great story. And a lot of people do prefer that one. I would say that would be a really good entry point for uh, anybody out there that's looking to get into the series. Gotcha. Well, let us know if you want us to talk some more. I'm sure we could probably get Chris to talk some more without even asking. So, (laughs) Yes. Um, Just to cover availability real quick, too. Um, Samurai Warriors Spirit of Sonata is on Steam currently for $49.99 American. So, and uh, it's the same for Samurai Warriors 4 too, which I think is not as good of an entry point, but it's still pretty good. And then 5 is on there for $60. Gotcha. So those are your options, at least uh, for PC users. And Switch, I think, is the same for uh, 5. Perfect. Well, let's wrap it there. Um, You can... Follow us on Twitter at the Turn by Turn Pod or on Apple Podcasts. You can find us and you could give us a five star review and that would be totally cool. Uh, Chris, where can they find you? Uh, Same places. Um, I also, if you're so inclined and want to hear me talk a little bit more, um, I do a YouTube. I I have a YouTube channel called Nigh Hill where I play Shining Force games mostly. Um, but I would not be opposed to talking about samurai stuff on there uh, if that's something people wanted more of. Um, and you can also find me on Twitter to talk about this anytime at, uh, what is my at here? At Chris underscore Harkey, H-A-R-K-E-Y. Definitely hit me up and we can talk all sorts of warrior stuff or samurai stuff or RPG stuff or whatever you want. I just like talking about stories. All right. Well, we'll wrap it up there and we will talk to you soon. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks for tuning in. (laughs) 